Um, hello. Um, I'm actually, I'm an occasional academic. Uh, most of my time is actually spent working in advertising. Um, that's why we have this nice kind of Helvetica stuff. So if you stick around for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you about brands and advertising and where they sit with uh, mobile. Um, I'm also going to give you texting sheep, but if you get right past the texting sheep, you also get the free drinks at the end. So this is my kind of incentive to keep you guys here. Um, so well, I basically spend my day talking to brands and trying to get them to understand mobile and how it's this channel for engagement and how they can work with their customers and do things better. And also to understand the future. One of the things about mobile is there's a lot of data around. And one of the, what, we start by, uh, what we start doing is looking at the mobile landscape. So what kind of phones people have got and also where it's going. Now I thought, well, for Ted, it's always good to bring some new research. So what I've done is I've taken all that research that's out there on the internet, and I've kind of gathered it all together, and I've created this one kind of mega chart that essentially explains mobile, and here is the chart. Um, so, as I always explain to people, here is mobile stuff, and it's anything you want, smartphone adoption. So smartphones are being adopted at about three times the rate at which babies are being born. Um, mobile commerce is going up at a similar rate. Use of mobile social media. And you're seeing this massive switch into mobile. So... Uh, this is open source, you can all make use of this. Um, so everything in mobile goes that way, with the possible exception of Nokia, which um, sadly their sales are kind of going in the opposite direction. So then Brian said, well, what, no, come on, what is the future? Where's the technology going to go? So I just give them this date, 2045. Um, some of you may know this, it's from science fiction, it's the idea, it's called the point of singularity. So at this date, um, as we see computing power expand, uh, what we know as a mobile phone will be the size of a, a tiny little dot and about a billion times more powerful. Of course, at that point, what happens is machines become sentient and they kind of take over the world in a, in a matrix sort of style. Um, Google are actually working on that. They've developed an artificial intelligence machine. They're using the cloud to develop these kinds of algorithms. So I don't know. There's a whole debate about whether this is actually a possibility or not, but certainly people like Google are trying to make it happen. Um, but of course, the reality is, so when it comes to mobile, brands always talk about these words. They love these words, which is very appropriate for today, creativity and innovation. And when they talk about innovating, what they really want to know from me is what are these fantastic technologies that are going to come in the future that's going to do the, all this kind of whizzy stuff. Um, and mobile is a very innovative space. If you think about it, for the last 10 years or so, every time you bought a mobile device, it does something new. It does something different. You've got cameras, you've got apps, you've got colour screens. So the potential is definitely there. So I explain all this to them, and then what they do is they come back and say, right, we want to build an app. Um, and then they'll do something like this, which is usually a not very good game. Uh, try desperately to talk them out of it. And on the whole, most brand apps are useless. This isn't just me saying it. This is figures from Deloitte. 80% of brand apps are downloaded less than 1,000 times. And when they are downloaded, most of them are used just once or never at all. So clearly, something's going wrong. Brands are not getting it right. I think the problem is this for brands, which is that as consumers, we really don't care that much. If you think about how you use your mobile devices, they become these personal devices. We don't share them with anyone. They're the things that we communicate with our friends. They're the things that we um, text our loved ones on. It's entertainment. We play games. We play Fruit Ninja and Angry Birds. And we go on YouTube and we look at videos of cats. <laughs> and again, that isn't me who's making it up. When Google put their AI engine to the task of understanding the world, the first thing it did was looking through YouTube videos, try to define the concept of a cat. That's better. And it isn't just me either. If you look at, so mobile is this massively personal space. And if you get it wrong as a brand, people will not thank you for it. This is a Tumblr. Apparently, I'm allowed to swear. I don't want your fucking app. Um, and it's basically just a whole list of brands, brands who are insisting that people actually shouldn't go on the channels that they choose to do, like the mobile web, and they should be downloading their app. Um, so I always say to brands, it's not about the technology. Why not think about your users, your customers? Think about people. And what it means at the end of the day is really the future of mobile is about thinking about this stuff, service. 
Um, and it's, it's amazing because actually for me the most innovative, the most creative ideas are the simplest ones, the simple solutions. Take someone like um, these guys, they just do it really well. eBay are doing about four million dollars a year of transaction, even good old Marks and Sparks. They do a really nice job, just simple texts that people have opted in for, that come just once a month. Um, Amazon, again, if you look at things like the one click, it's just a really good example of how you do service in a seamless way, and Nike have consistently done mobile really well. On the whole, most brands don't. One example that I absolutely love is Gatwick Airport. They went uh, independent of BAA a couple of years back, and they wanted to show how they were all about service. So all they did is they put an invitation on the checking board, which is, tweet us anything you like, and we will go and sort that out. They had a team of six people. They have a team of six people. Their job is to run around the airport and sort out those problems, whether the toilets are unclean, or even things like border control, where they don't have any real control over. They'll go down there and try and sort out the queues, try and get more staff on there. And go and look at their Twitter feed, because it's great. Because it's just full of people just getting their problem solved in a really simple and imaginative way. But brands don't always get it right. Last Christmas, Starbucks decided to do a campaign. So it was less about service, it was more about people celebrating their brand. And it was the hashtag, spread the cheer. So you had to tweet stuff of your favorite uh, Christmas cheer ideas. They put a board up at um, Natural History Museum. And this is what people were tweeting. Um, hey, Starbucks, pay your fucking tax. Um, <laughs> and it's a good example of that kind of consumer indifference to all of this. There are some good things going on. This appeared just last week from Mercedes. What they're doing is they're putting QR codes in cars. Now, I really I have a thing about QR codes, about how pointless they are, um, and don't put them on moving objects, and nobody really scans a QR code. But what they've done here is they've actually put them all around the cars, and in the event of an accident... The emergency services can simply scan that QR code and it will tell them the quickest way to access the vehicle to get the casualty out. Which is great. The irony is that that's a QR code coming full circle because in the early 90s, Japanese car manufacturers used QR codes to, uh, to track car parts. And the augmented reality, there's another piece of technology that brands will try and uh, get in on. I've seen uh, uh, fruit juice bottles and you scan it with augmented reality and there's, there's exploding fruit. There's no benefit to that, whereas this app, which is just out, is a really nice example of where you can simply scan the bonnet of your car and it will show you where the parts are. You can then choose which part you want to disassemble and through augmented reality it will show you, it will talk you through exactly how to do that. So imagine you get your Billy shelves from Ikea, you scan the box and it just shows you how to put it together. So these are the kind of ways that brands can be actually being useful to their customers right now. So where are smartphones going? Well, I think largely speaking, and most of us in this industry are sort of saying, look, guys, um, this isn't the future. Um, we've kind of reached a conclusion with smartphones. They're probably, I mean, they're going to get faster, they're going to get brighter. But essentially, if you think about the functions, there's kind of everything you need now. And most of our digital lives are now starting, and they become central to these devices. So actually, the future of the phone is probably not a phone at all. There's certainly going to be some enhancements. There's things like flexible screens. There's been demos of uh, phones where the edges curl up. When it rings, you can roll them up, stick them inside your pocket. This is an example. It's a company called Senseg in fi uh, Finland, and it's called a haptic screen. And so this is, gives a sense of touch, a sense of three dimensions. And you can do really clever, fun things like with it. And it will certainly improve our experience with the smartphone. But it's not really shifting the smartphone onwards that much. So a lot of people are saying, this is the future. So this is Google Glass. Um, there's been a lot of it about at the minute, a lot of people wearing it. There's been a big debate. So some of my colleagues in this field are saying, look, this is the next big innovation. Now, if you think about how personal a mobile phone is, once you start wearing glasses for a brand, this is going to be really, really personal. And all the issues, there's already massive issues about privacy, the fact that you're uploading massive amounts of data to the cloud, and similarly from the wearer as well, that the wearer has the opportunity to invade people's privacy in a, in a way that they haven't done before. And people are particularly concerned about where it's going. The key about something like Google Glass is the fact that this is no longer a smartphone, it's become a connected object. I think my big problem with it is, although this is, this is an attempt to make it look better, is the thing just looks silly. Um, so this is from uh, New York Fashion Week, Diane von, Diane von Fusterberg. And here are the models wearing it. But actually, if you go on yet another Tumblr, here you go. White women wearing Google Glass. And, you know, look, I just think it's, you know, it's another segue. It's another one of these kind of niche products that will appeal to a certain 
techie audience, but essentially it's not the kind of thing that we will necessarily go around wearing it every day. I mean, I say that a lot of people are trying to get into this whole kind of area of, of wearing glasses, and even Microsoft have a patent out for it. I actually discovered a video yesterday that of Microsoft's new product. Here it is. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, It's, a, it's an animated GIF, by the way. And even Apple, I mean, we don't know what the next generation is going to be, but they have a patent out. This is someone else's mock-up of what it might be, but a patent out for a wristwatch, a wearable device. Um, and brands are beginning to pick up on that. This is, this is Nike Fuel, and again, there's a big debate. Is, is this useful, or is this just advertising? But what they did is they took their service, the running apps, and put it into using you know, the, the new power of computing, this low-cost computing, put it into this wristband, then connects through to their mobile device. And they spent many years and millions of dollars getting to that point. What's interesting is that kind of innovation and creativity isn't always about money. In fact, it's never about money. It's never about spending. Here's an example from such a pizza company in Dubai, very random. Uh, they created this fridge magnet. It's Bluetooth. So what you do is you put it on your fridge. When you want a pizza, you simply press that button. It connects through your mobile phone dials the pizza company and orders the favourite pizza that you've registered with them. And it's these kinds of fun, sort of service engaging stuff that's actually going to get people interested in the future. I guess for me the real potential of mobile devices though is, is particularly in the health area. And there's been lots of things about weighing machines, blood pressure monitors, diabetic testers. And they connect into smartphones, they can provide the user with information, but what they can also do is they can then send that information to the, to the, to the medics, to your doctors. And it's going to actually both increase people's wellness, but also reduce the crime to visit a doctor. This is called Scanadu. It's about to be launched in beta. And this is a device that can actually uninvasively scan a number of the body's vital signs and provide that information back. This is actually, there's an X prize for a tricorder. The tricorder is the thing in Star Trek that they waved. And, and, and people are talking that they are likely to be able to win that by diagnosing 10 different vital life signs in a non-invasive way. And this is all about where the technology kind of kicks in. But I think, you know, again, if we talk about those are things that have had a massive investment, but actually there's very simple ways that mobile can make, people, make people's lives much better in the future. Uh, mosquitoes, they don't go very far, a mosquito. It can't fly very far. The problem with mosquitoes is they jump onto people and clothing and bags and things like that. So uh, they do start to travel a distance. So what they've started to do in Kenya is to map the use of mobile devices across networks, so where people are going with their mobile phones. And from that, they can actually monitor the spread of mosquitoes. And they're able to now, they're now beginning to implement new vaccines, and it can inform their vaccination program so they can be the most effective that they can with it. Um, and the fact that you have these, these unique devices creates a massive opportunity to solve some, some big problems. And with a billion smartphones out there, we can actually use that computing power to solve even bigger problems. I promised you texting sheep, and here they are. Um, so what they've done in Switzerland is they've hooked up um, sensors to sheep's brains. And what they find is that when uh, there's a wolf in the area, their brain activity goes particularly high. So in doing that, all they have to do is to put a simple GSM chip, a simple mobile chip, to accompany that, and it will send a text to the farmer to say there's a wolf in the area, the farmer to the shepherd, <laughs> and they can come and help them. Um, and they're doing stuff with cows, which is quite interesting. They're putting uh, heat sensors and GPS chips onto cows, and what they can do is to monitor when a cow is at its most fertile, and in doing that, and then it, it sends information to an app to the farmer, it tells them where the cow is. They can go and then inseminate them. In the trials, this was done in Austria, in the trials that they've done, 600% increase in cow production, which at a time when we've got scarcity of land resources, uh, that is a really, really useful thing to be had. So I guess really, if you want to understand all of this and what's happening with mobile between now and point of singularity in 2045, the key thing is to remember that it's really not about the technology. It's about understanding users. It's understanding that mobile is this massively powerful device. But really what we're all about is delivering 
the service. Now, when 2045 does kick in and the smartphones get to that point where they become sentient and take over the world, I'm actually not that worried. Um, what's going to happen is they're going to try and make sense of the world by going online. They're going to look at the internet. And what they're going to decide is that essentially the cats are in charge. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>